Yeah, so Brent waited till the end, but I'll do it now. So everybody's here. So uh, I never, I don't know who's going to be here at the end to thank. So uh, I have four former budget chairs on this committee. So I want to thank y'all for all your help and your second guessing and your uh, <laughs> and your recommendations and uh, all of that. I want to thank y'all so much. <laughs> and I have a lot of vice chairs here too. So I want to thank all of y'all as well, especially my vice chair, Jennifer, you did a great job. Thank you so much. And then the folks over here, if you don't know, they do all the work. If anybody out there, you know, these are the, this lady right here, Margaret, Miss Darby, she does a lot of work for me and tells me what's going on and she keeps me in. And then Kelly, she did a lot. Mary Jo did a lot. And then Mike, he tells me what to do. And sometimes I don't agree with him, but, uh, but uh, we try to all work together. So thank you all so very much. We've had a great year. So thank you. So I'm going to run through the consent calendar. We didn't have anybody sign up to speak. So uh, we don't have to, we don't have anybody speaking tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and run through the consent. If you want something pulled, just take a look and then let me know. So everybody kick back, relax for a few minutes. 2023-2347 O'Connell wrote in Withers and Others approves participation agreement between the Metro Department of Water and Sewerage Services and Clark UMC Community Development Corporation to provide public water service improvements for Clark UMC's proposed development, as well as other existing properties in the area. 2023-2361 wrote in Syracuse appropriates 28250 from the Community Safety Fund for a grant to Rocket Town in Middle Tennessee for Nap Napier and Sudicum Community Safety Programs. 2023-2362 wrote in, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. 2023-2362 <laughs> wrote in Syracuse and Welsh appropriates $59,442 from the Community Safety Fund for a grant to the Rafa Institute in Napier and Sudicum Community Safety Programs. 2023-2363 Tombs amends resolution number RS2022-1307, which appropriates funding for the American Rescue Plan Act to the Community Safety Partnership Fund to approve evidence-based community solutions to interpersonal violence. 2023-2364 wrote in Welsh Hancock. Approves Amendment 1 to an Adult Drug Court and Veterans Treatment Court Discretionary Program Grant from the U.S. Department of Justice to the Metropolitan General Sessions Court to implement a DUI court to serve participants convicted of misdemeanor DUI offenses. 2023-2365, Hancock and Roten. Authorizes the Metropolitan Development and housing agency to enter into a pilot agreement and accept payment in lieu of in lieu of ad valorem taxes with respect to a multifamily housing project located at 333 Rio Vista Drive. 2023-2366 Parker and Roten authorizes the Metropolitan Development of Housing Agency to enter into a pilot agreement and accept payments in lieu of ad valorem taxes with respect to a multifamily housing project located at 590 Joseph Avenue. 2023-2367 O'Connell wrote in Withers approves the Eighth Amendment to a lease agreement between the Metropolitan Government and Square Investment Holdings, LLC, for office space in the Washington Square Building located at 222 Second Avenue North. Have a letter of approval from Councilmember O'Connell. 2023-2368 wrote in Withers approves an amendment to the intergovernmental license agreement between the Metropolitan Government and the United States Department of Defense to enter certain property located at 1414 County, County Hospital Road for limited military training purposes. 2023-2369. Fan. Oh, my apologies. We have a I've been told that's off consent because we have a proposed amendment on that. 2023-2370 wrote in Welsh amends RS 2022-1860 to change the implementation strategy for the collective or shared equity housing activity from an RFP to de a designated set-aside in Barnes funding round. Item 13 on the count. 2023-2371, Roten Benedict approves a contract between the Metropolitan Government and Johnson Control, Inc. to provide Medicis service maintenance and upgrades 2023-2371. 2372, Rutten Benedict and Welsh. Approves Amendment 1 to a grant from the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee to the Information Technology Services Department to fund the position of Digital Inclusion Officer to manage the allocation of resources to ensure equitable services delivery and expand economic opportunities in meeting the needs of the underserved. 2023-2373, Rutten Benedict and Welsh. Approves Amendment number 2 to a sole source contract between the Metropolitan Government and Tyler Technologies to increase the value of the contract. 2023-2374, Rutten Hurts, Welsh and Hancock. 
approves a grant from Tennessee State Library and Archives to the National Public Library to target library materials to persons having difficulty using a library and to provide special services to children in the underserved. 2023-2375 wrote and hurt Welsh and others. Appropriates $576,345 to increase the individual grant amounts from the National Public Library to specific nonprofit organizations for the expansion of free and high quality after school and summer programming through the library's National After Zone Alliance out of school time coordinating system. 2023-2376 wrote in Syracuse and Hancock. Approves a grant from the U.S. Environment Protection Agency to the Metropolitan Board of Health to update emission inventory software for the ongoing collection of data on ambient air concentrations for fine particulate matter in Nashville, Tennessee. 2023-2377 wrote in Syracuse and Welsh approves amendment two to a grant from the Tennessee Department of Human Services to the Metropolitan Board of Health to conduct immunization record record audits for child care centers, drop-in centers, and group child care homes to ensure the safety and well-being of children and families in Tennessee. 2023-2378, Roten, Druffle, Welsh, and Hancock approves a grant from the Greater National Regional Council to the Metropolitan Social Services Commission to provide nutrition services for older or disabled adults and transportation services for eligible persons. 2023-2379, Roten, Syracuse approves a grant from the Tennessee Office of Criminal Justice Programs to to the Office of Family Safety to offset funding reductions in the current contract to ensure the continued provisions of services in the Nashville's Family Safety Centers. 2023-2380 wrote in Syracuse. Um, that one is not on consent. My apologies. 2023-2381 Druffle wrote in Withers and Pulley. Uh, that one's not on consent either. We have a proposed amendment on that one. On number 25, 2023-2383 approves a donation from Dickerson Nashville owner LP to the amount, in the amount of $20,000 as a contribution towards infrastructure improvements at the intersection of Dickerson Pike and Lemuel Road. Number 26 was on consent, but I've taken it off because it's the same as number 27. So in case anybody wants to discuss those, I've taken those off consent. 2023-2387, by wrote and authorizes Metropolitan Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of April Parker against the Metropolitan Government in the amount of $51,000 and that said amount be paid from the self-insured liability fund. Mm -hmm. Item number 29. Bradford wrote in Withers and Pulley approves a participation agreement between the Metropolitan Department of Water and Sewerage Service and Metropolitan National Airport Authority to provide public water service improvements for MNAA's proposed development as well as other existing properties in the area. 2023-2390 wrote in Pulley approves a hazard mitigation grant from the Tennessee Department of Military and the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency to the Department of Water and Sewerage Services to allow for the reimbursement of previously awarded funds. 2023-2391 wrote in Withers and Pulley authorizes the Director of Public Property to exercise an option agreement for the purchase of a flood-prone property located at 720 Height Street for Metro Water Services. And 2023-2392, by wrote and authorizes the Metropolitan Department of Law to compromise and settle the personal injury claim of Marcus Olivares Rodriguez against the Metropolitan Government in the amount of $100,000 with said amount to be paid out, to the self in, out of the self-insured liability fund. Those are everything on consent. Does anything need to be pulled? If so, please raise your hand. Councilmember Swore, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Uh, would you please pull 2023-2361? 62, 67, and 72, please. 67, what was the last one? I apologize. 72. 72. Council Member Allen, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you pull RS 2023, 2391? They are pulled. Anything else? Seeing none, can I get a motion on the consent calendar? Moved properly. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You approve the consent calendar. 13 in favor, zero against. All right. Starting back at the top of the calendar, 
wrote in 2023-2340, wrote in Hancock, approves a memorandum of understanding between the United States Department of Homeland Security and the Metropolitan Government for participation in the E-Verify program. This was uh, held up a week, uh, one meeting, so got a motion properly seconded. Do um, we have any questions on this? Councilmember Swar, you are recognized. Thank you, Chair. Let me get up. Um, so when I was reading this initially, I thought it was a mandatory for all employers that the new Tennessee law, uh, effective January 2023, says if you have more than 50 employees. But it appears as if it's only for private employers. Can the legal team clarify that, please? You recognize. There you go. Um, the, 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 it, it applies to private employers, but not to government employers. Not to government employers. So if it doesn't apply to Metro, why is Metro trying to do this now? Mr. Jamison, you recognize. I'm not sure what information I have, and I think we have Matt Purvis here from NDOT um, and uh, others from HR. Uh, the, what actually prompted it was that there was uh, an engineer, foreign-born engineer at NDOT that needed uh, citizenship verification or eligibility verification, and E-Verify is the most expedient route for that. It's a free internet-based system that relies on records from Social Security Administration, Department of Homeland Security, and can verify uh, status and eligibility uh, relatively promptly. Um, it's not anything that we're mandated to do, but it's something that I think you'll hear from INDOT representatives, HR representatives, of something that's expedient and allows us to get quality personnel, particularly of uh, that may not be U.S. citizens uh, on board uh, and uh, quickly. With that, I'll let, uh, if I can, Mr. Purvis. And before Matt speaks, let me apologize to you because he and I spoke this afternoon at the time mm -hmm. when I would read the rules on the state website, I just thought it's every emplo employer. I did not realize it was just private. So my question to you is, uh, why now? Why not use uh, other form of verification that we've been using up till now? Uh, it's mostly due to the expediency required by this uh, specific employees, specific situation. Uh, they're a part of a certain certain program that requires E-Verify. Uh, and we do have our immigration lawyer here to talk about that employee specifically, but I will say uh, it is several pronged at this point why we were wanting E-Verify. This specific employee was the genesis of us looking into it. Uh, but when we, when we contacted Metro HR, they had independently been looking at it as well for other purposes, which I'm sure Director Hall can speak to. Um, and then in addition, while we've been trying to figure this out for this, this singular employee, uh, we've been fielding a lot of new potential candidates for other engineer positions. And the response from most of those engineers, uh, several of them at least, um, when we tell them that we are not a part of the E-Verify program, we have lost out on those candidates. Uh, so it's now become bigger than just this one singular employee, uh, but the expediency is certainly due to this employee. Um, and from, one, from my understanding, and Director Hall can, can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but Metro as a whole does not have a sponsorship program in place. Uh, otherwise, we would have other avenues, but due to the expediency and the lack of other sponsorship programs, uh, E-Verify, due to the recommendation of our lawyer, is the way to do it, to save this employee, to stay with the organization. You're right, now. Well, my name is Doug Russo, and I'm outside Immigration Counsel for Metro, and I was uh, appointed probably one or two months ago. I wanted to give a little bit more information about um, this particular case. This student is in what's called OPT, which is Optional Practical Training. Once an F-1 student, which is a foreign national student, graduates, they get one year of post-completion Optional Practical Training. If the individual graduated with a STEM degree, sciences, technology, engineering, or mathematics, then they are eligible for two additional years of OPT. But the caveat is that STEM OPT extensions, those additional two years, are only eligible for employers that are E-Verify employers. So that was the origin of, of the, the E-Verify discussion for that particular individual, and I'm available for any questions related to E-Verify that you all have tonight. 
Thank you. And so my question for, oh, I'm sorry, Chair. Oh, that's all right. You're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, 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 get, I get the explanation. And so this is something we're trying to bring along. And the only way we can bring that person into the fold is if we use the E-Verify program. So for Director All, I guess uh, my question is, when I look at the analysis, there's a lot of uh, compliance issues that are stated even in there in terms of you cannot use it on current employees, you cannot use it while somebody is just applying for position, it's only when an offer is being made. So how do we make sure that we stay in compliance with all of those uh, requirements that are attached to it, if we do go that route? Councilmember, that would be our intent. Um, and, and just to kind of clarify some points that Mr. Purvis made and, and to make sure um, before this happened, um, as part of our regular function and duties working with the finance department, last fall, um, as we were having some of our ongoing discussions, one of the things that we started discussing was the fact that there are, we don't have a clear way to always track um, that we've got, like we have an onboarding process, we do a 99 form, but sometimes there are payroll and tax implications that cannot be verified outside of a system like E-Verify and that we had possibly a gap. So um, after consultation with our finance partners, we looked internally, we spoke, you know, they said E-Verify is a good program. We had looked at it before. To your earlier point, it has not always been required, um, but we knew that this was a, a known risk and pain point for our finance partners. We worked with it. We figured it could work in our processes. We worked pretty extensively just trying to understand from the Department of Homeland Security how it could work for our organization. If we thought it's something we could administratively support, um, and we could. So we were we were planning to move this forward at some point. We weren't necessarily in a hurry to do so. We wanted to make sure that we had clear understandings so we could properly implement this with departments, properly train them. So we had kind of planned to just bring this at the next council term, not be in a rush, have full discussion, full transparency. And then, which I did know about this sponsorship process with NDOT, but not about the C-Verify component, they contacted us and said, hey, are you guys looking at E-Verify? And I said, yes, we are evaluating whether we're doing that. We're planning on possibly moving forward with this maybe later in the fall. And then they let us know about the emergency. That's what's escalated the timing of it. But I do want to at least clarify that there was a real need and hearty discussion with our finance partners regarding some of the tax and payroll components that are really necessary for them to be, to be able to verify so they can speak to those components, but we were trying to be responsive to that need with our partners in finance. So we've been studying this for six, nine months at this point. Right. Thank you, Chair. And so my, what I hear is that this is something you're looking at, but you're not ready for yet. And so even the nuances in terms of the compliance, you're not ready for yet. So my question to the NDOT team is that, is there any urgency in passing this today or can it wait until you have all your ducks in a row? We have our ducks in a row. We just weren't going to race it at the end of a council term. I think that was more of a timing component. We are ready to go, but we do need a, a couple of months to properly implement and train before we make the change to do this as our new onboarding tool. We can't pick and choose and just have this apply to some candidates and not others. That could be discriminatory in nature. So this would be a full switch on how we do our onboarding process. We think it's a good fit. So we're ready to do this, but part of the council approval, which has to happen first, would allow us the time over the next two months to properly implement and train our departments. And that timing would align that would meet the need for NDOT. If we wait for the new council to do this, um, by the time we do get hopefully an approval by council to use this and we implement and train and then deploy this across the organization, we're likely to have missed the window for the NDOT employee. Thank you. I'll let... Thank you. Councilmember Sledge, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, for whoever it's appropriate, what are the um, what are the data sharing guidelines and requirements associated with E-Verify? Oh. You're recognized at the back. I don't know that I can answer specifically all of the ins and outs of that, but 
there is data sharing between the Department of Homeland Security and the Social Security Administration. And those two organizations work together to determine whether somebody has authorization to work in the United States, whether they are a foreign national who's sponsored, a foreign national who has some other employment authorization, or a U.S. citizen. So the kind of information that would be shared would be personal data as well as a social security number, which is required for E-Verify. Are there, are there MOAs included with like USCIS and ICE? To my knowledge, well, it would be with, there's an MOU that Metro would sign that would be with the Department of Homeland Security and the Social Security Administration. ICE is part of the Department of Homeland Security. I'm not sure the ins and outs of how those individuals or those individual groups work together. Um, but just from experience, I don't see it as a high risk of creating a raid or something along those lines. But DHS does have an MOA with USCIS and ICE over E-Verify, correct? I mean, they're part of Department of Homeland Security, USCIS, Customs and Border Protection, ICE are all Department of Homeland Security agencies. Um, so I would think that they all could work together. And regarding how E-Verify is administered and I guess audited, then those departments and sub-departments would then have the ability to audit Metro over its E-Verify usage. And I honestly don't know the inner workings of Department of Homeland Security, but I would say it would be reasonable to think that they have access to each other's data. I don't know for sure of any existing MOUs though between DHS agencies like ICE, USCIS, et cetera. And then I guess that's, I guess that's kind of speaks to Council Member Sawar's point is why are we gonna rush this if we don't have the answers? And it seems fairly apparent that we don't. So I'm, I'm gonna move this for a deferral. We got a motion on the floor for a deferral. What's the length of, I guess it's next term since it's the deferral. I, I suppose to keep it away from the floor, I would make it an indefinite deferral. Yeah, yeah, essentially it'd be a withdrawal, so. But it's a motion for a deferral, indefinite deferral, I'm sorry. Uh, all right, on the indefinite deferral, council member Virtue, you're recognized. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, can they speak to you, like, what will this do, the indefinite deferral um, for hiring? and any applicants that may be in the hiring pool at this juncture. Whoever would like to take it in the back, you're recognized. Um, it won't have any impact on our ability to hire right now. However, as uh, Attorney Russo and as Mr. Purvis has stated, it likely means that we will not be able to retain the employee that's currently in question at NDOT. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We're on the deferral. Uh, Council Member Benedict, to recognize. Thank you, Chair. Just follow up to that question, if I may. Is it um, is the employee seeking any other options? Are there other options? I guess this might be for the attorney. Is the employee seeking other options through outside counsel or other ways that uh, they may be able to um, be employed or get citizenship or whatnot or work visa? Yeah, the individual has applied for permanent residence and did that on his or her own. Um, I don't want to speak too much about specific details due to confidentiality and things like that, but there's a certain backlog essentially. And right now, because an immigrant visa or a green card is not immediately available, that permanent residence case is essentially on hold for the time being. So the, the best plan for retaining immediate work authorization was for um, you know, the, the STEM OPT extension. There could be other sponsorship avenues. For example, Metro Council could sponsor, or Metro could sponsor the individual for an H-1B, which is for professional level workers. That's usually limited to a certain number per fiscal year. Um, there could be an exemption for Metro as a governmental research entity. The costs associated with an H-1B petition would exceed those related to a STEM OPT extension. 
Um, but I think long-term costs would be difficult to calculate. I think it's it's something in terms of long-term costs that, that Metro should consider. I know Director Hall has indicated that they're ready to do E-Verify and presumably they've thought of the costs associated with administering that program. Um, but the extension for H-1B is not, or the change of status from F-1 to H-1B is not something that this individual could do on their own. It would be re required for, you know, government fees and legal fees, et cetera. But that could be a viable option. Thank you. So it sounds like since there's an opportunity for this employee um, to uh, gain access through other ways, I would rather, I'm speaking in support of the deferral. It sounds like an H-1B visa is a route that Metro could take for one employee. We're not talking about the cost for enterprise-wide or government-wide right now. So to me, it sounds like there's a solution that would work for this employee. So I'm in favor of the deferral. Councilman Braven, you recognize. Thank you. I had a question kind of related to the deferral about the employee in question, it's kind of following up with Council Member Benedict. What's the timing look like? I mean, are we talking about somebody that's like, okay, we don't vote on this or we defer it, and then two weeks later they're moving out of the country? You know, how, how are we on that side of it? I think it's less a matter of moving out of the country. If, if council does not approve, it's more a matter of I'm going to take a job with an agency that does have it. Uh, because this, it's not like we're piloting this with DHS. Uh, TDOT is E-Verified, Chattanooga, Knoxville, Memphis. I mean, all of our, all of our uh, I guess, peers are all a part of this already. Um, so... It, it would be, it's, it's a matter of I'm fielding other job opportunities away from Metro uh, that can offer this to me. And, and that would be the, the result if we don't pass it, or if Thank this you. body doesn't. Council Member Mendez, you recognize. Thanks, this is another question for council, um, or Matt, I guess. Um, so uh, check, check my logic here. Um, if the concern is that running somebody through E-Verify triggers the sharing of information with agencies. Um, to me, I view that as not a substantial risk um, because if they go and get hired, the first time the city files a payroll tax return, that's gonna have a name and social security number um, and all that information is available to, I assume, any agency in the federal government. So to me, like anybody who's going to get hired is fully identifiable by the government. I see that I'm probably wrong because uh, Council Member Sepulveda is raising her hand. <laughs> um, but that, that's. Uh, do you guys have a comment on that? That's. I don't. I don't see the extra risk. Um, I, I agree with your with your analysis. Um, and I, I would say, I, I, from what I understand, we've all, part of what's spurred. Uh, Metro HR to look into this originally was we were getting, I think, messages from messages from the IRS. Our, 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 our beautiful finance team um, asking us because of some of the risks, the payroll and tax implications they have when they are paying people incorrectly. But Kelly, I would welcome your comments on that. Kelly, you're right now. Thank you. Yeah, I think any time that we can um, <laughs> increase the accuracy of verification, it's going to be something where um, a proponent of it, it's not only a protection for Metro, but for those people that we are offering positions to, because you are correct, their information will go to a federal agency, either whether you get your first paycheck or in advance of that, and it could serve, may serve as a check for someone whose identity has already been stolen and, you know, Personally, it's happening to me right now, and it would have been really nice to be E-verified. Um, but again, I, I hear your concerns, um, but I, I, I guess any, any time we can increase accuracy, it's something we should investigate just to mitigate risk for the organization as well as our existing staff. Thank you. Council Member Sepulveda, what do you recognize? Oh, I'm sorry. She, she had had her hand up. Council Member Sepulveda, did you have a question? I did. Thank you, Chair, for recognizing me, even though I'm not on the committee. Um, I had a meeting a couple of days ago with uh, HR, Finance, uh, INDOT, and Turk, and we actually have a representative from Turk here who spoke specifically to Council Member uh, Mendez's question about what are the risks, and there have been 
several risks uh, in the past, and that's why we have so many um, agencies who work in immigration who have pushed against E-Verify. And I was wondering if the committee would uh, allow us to uh, let the representative from Turk speak to answer that question. I'll have to, someone on the committee will have to do that right now. We're on a uh, motion, we're on a deferral motion right now. Uh, if somebody wants to, related to the deferral, wants to hear from them. Councilmember Swar is next in line, so I have a feeling she'll want to hear from them. But Councilmember Swar, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Chair. I do have uh, two questions, but I also want to hear from the, uh, from the uh, representative. But before I do, uh, I have a question for the, for the immigration attorney. Uh, or maybe from the HR people. When I'm looking at the ER verification, it specifically says that you're not supposed to use it for current employees, it's for prospective employees. I hear that this person is an employee already. So it seems as if this is not something you use for a current employee. So am I misinterpreting that requirement? Yeah, thanks for the question. If Metro were to enroll in E-Verify, Metro would not have to go back and do E-Verify for all of its employees. However, Metro could use that sort of benefit for STEM OPT extensions. So that particular individual would not have to go through E-Verify unless employment has to be reauthorized or re-verified. Um, but it would be a requirement to sponsor them under what's called a STEM OPT extension to get them two additional years. So does that answer your question? No, because I, maybe I'm confused. I thought if they're already an employee, they don't need to go through verification. And, and they're already an employee, so then they don't need to go through it. So if we're doing it for this one employee, and they're already an employee, to me, it seems as if we can wait. That's the point I'm trying to make. Then let me ask the second question is that, as an immigrant who's gone through the visa process and, and, and green card and all that stuff, when you have an application in the system with uh, USCIS, you're still considered to be in status, and that does not impact your, your ability to work. Is that correct? Well, let me take the first question first, which okay. is, um, well, I, I first want to say, generally speaking, I am a supporter of, of immigrants. I own a, a local immigration law firm. Um, you know, I spend all day helping immigrants, um, and it's something I'm extremely passionate about. Passionate about. Um, with just clarifying that question about why is E-Verify necessary for this person, that person will not need to get E-Verified immediately to be eligible for a STEM OPT extension. Um, eligibility as an employer to be a STEM OPT employer in general does require that that employer be enrolled in E-Verify. So it's not really related to verifying that person under E-Verify. It's more about being enrolled as an E-Verify employer that would give Metro the ability to have STEM OPT workers. And then your second question related to does an extension allow somebody to continue working? That really depends on the type of status that they have. So I don't think I can give a broad um, answer. STEM OPT workers, as long as they have a STEM OPT extension filed, they can continue working for a certain number of days pending the adjudication of that application. Uh, thank you. And before we hear from the representative, I do want to say that, look, this is not a ding on whether this is against immigrants or not. But what I'm trying to say is, what is the rush? Uh, there are some things that are tied to this that I'm looking at compliance-wise that says must be in place before Metro uses it and make sure everybody's using it right, that I don't think we are there yet in terms of the training and the rollout of the application. And so that's where my concern is coming from, is that do we have to do it now? Uh, I want to make sure that if we have to do this, then we have everything in place uh, to be able to do it. So I think that clarification is also important. So, uh, Chair, if you would allow, please, I would like to hear from the talk representative in terms of what does this mean um, for immigrants. Thank you. Sure, without objection, uh, the person here from Turk, if they'd like to come up and speak. Just state your name, please, and you're recognized. Yeah, hey, everyone. Luis Mata with the Tennessee Immigrant Refugee Rights Coalition and Turk Votes. And I just want to say that we are completely, you know, we applaud the efforts of 
uh, Mr. Russo and uh, Metro for, you know, doing what we do on a daily basis to making sure that folks have, uh, you know, an immigration benefit and are able to thrive in our community. So we want to applaud them for uh, wanting to do that. However, I think that it's very clear, um, given our advocacy, you know, at the state level and at the federal level against E-Verify. Uh, E-Verify is a highly inaccurate and faulty program. Uh, and I think, you know, that the expediency uh, does not trump the incredibly high risk that comes with uh, setting up the infrastructure of the E-Verify program. Um, I think also to note is the financial burden. Um, that's one of our biggest concerns also is uh, that small businesses and also entities that are uh, having to, you know, uh, implement an E-Verify program can almost uh, have to pay the, the financial burden of close to $24,000. Um, but I think, uh, you know, something that, that we always say is is um, right now that the system is incredibly inaccurate. And I think that that's where, where we stand right now. Um, we also met with council uh, and some of our national partners, uh, and we actually have some alternatives uh, for Metro and, you know, uh, I think also for this individual who is trying to seek an immigration benefit. Um, one of which is, you know, I'm glad that Mr. Russo presented the fact that he's uh, this other individual, uh, him or her already uh, trying to seek another uh, pathway there. And that's actually one of our recommendations because we actually uh, want to stay away from the E-Verify system. Uh, but that's all I have for now. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. All right, we are on an indefinite deferral. I see no other hands. Um, so I think what we'll do is, since uh, it looks like there might be some debate, we've already had the debate here. So um, all in favor of an indefinite deferral, please raise your hand. Can y'all do that one more time for us? We were sorry, y'all. All right, six in favor. All opposed, please raise your hand. Two opposed. Oh, all the abstentions. I apologize. All the abstentions. In five. Six in favor, two against, five abstentions. It uh, recommend for indefinite deferral. Thanks, y'all, for the discussion. I appreciate everybody that was here. Moving on, 2023-2361, Roten in Syracuse appropriates 28250 from the Community Safety Fund for a grant to Rocket Town of Middle Tennessee for Napier and Sudicum Community Safety Programs. Um, motion properly seconded. Um, Council Member Suara, you asked that this get pulled from consent. Did you have a question on this one? Yes, please. You're recognized. Oh, thank you, Chief. Which one is this, 2361? Yes. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick questions. I wanted to, um, when I look on the website, this is a religious-based organization. And in looking at the website, it did say that after the kids has been exposed to the activity that they wanted to do, the next step will be to introduce them to religious-based therapy, which includes the uh, Kate's Church, I think that's what it's called. I just wanted to know, uh, um, I'm not a, I don't object to uh, Christian children being taken to church and being preached to, I think that's fine. But this is a Metro uh, housing project. What happens to children that do not want to participate in the religious aspect of the program? Is there an exception for them? And how do we make sure that they actually get the opportunity to um, say no? And then the second part of the question is that this is the same for this one and the next one is, how do we measure success with this program uh, in terms of whatever we be, we're doing? How do we make sure that it's doing what we intend for it to do? Thank you. Lacey, you're recognized at the back. If you'd introduce yourself, please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mike Lacey from the Mayor's Office of Community Safety. Um, fully understand and acknowledge your concern regarding the religious education aspect of anything that's being funded um, with uh, government monies. Um, we've been having uh, 
grant partnership with Rocket Town for the past year for this housing community. And one thing that we wanted to express to them as explicitly important was reaching the people in this community who wanted to attend. Um, we actually pushed for them to get a van to take people from the community because they felt that there was danger on site for them commuting there. And they've been a very valuable partner in understanding how to reach these specific populations. I'll be honest, we haven't directly discussed the limitations of their religious programming. We do have regular check-ins with them and hear from a lot of people in this community at the Napier and Sudicum community safety meetings. Um, we're very happy to keep our ears open to any complaints of this and for them to understand that these need to be open and accessible and in that sense uh, not leading anyone towards a denomination or religion that they're not comfortable with. Councilman Director. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I've looked at this system and they do a lot of great work for kids, so I'm not opposed to us using them in any way or form. Uh, and I think that as long as it's limited to the programs that help kids get out of trouble, it's a good program to have. The second part of it about the religious part, I think I would prefer for Metro, as you're talking to them, to make sure that this is not a condition for participation and that a kid that does not want to do that part of it does not get to miss out on the other programs. I think if, if it's Metro funded, the kids should be able to do the other activities without having to do the religious part. And I will expect Metro to be the one to at least speak out against that or say something to that effect. I think you can hold us accountable to that in the full respect that it's appropriate for us to say that. And I recommend the Community Safety Partnership Funds Advisory Board as our oversight committee that can hold us to those expectations. Um, thank you. And then the second question was about what is the metrics for measuring the uh, success or, or that this program and the next one that we, so there's no point in asking twice, Absolutely. making sure that they're doing what they intended to do. When it comes to community safety, what we're looking at is to have opportunities for youth that are in areas where there are, are high rates of crime and for them to be able to have safe access to it. So when looking at programming, ones that align with um, cognitive behavioral therapy is what's academically most valued. But prior to that, just frankly attendance, having opportunities for people. So what we collect on before any invoice is in respect to the populations that you're being contracted to serve. So in this case, people who live in Napier and Sudicum, how many net new participants, how many unique participants, and how many overall participants did you have from that community? And we collect that at every point that they submit invoices. Thank you, council member. Seeing no other hands, all in favor? Any opposed? You approve 13 in favor, zero against. Council member, you asked that the next one be pulled as well, but I, I think it's the same. Uh, okay, so the next one, number 2023-2362, appropriates 59,000 from the Community Safety Fund or Rofna Institute for Napier and Sudicum Community Safety Programs. Motion properly seconded. All in favor? Any opposed? You approve 13 in favor, zero against. Number nine. We have a letter for Council Member O'Connell approving this. Approves an eighth amendment to the lease agreement between the Metropolitan Government and Square Investment Holdings, LLC, for office space in the Washington Square building located at 222 2nd Avenue North. Council Member Swore, you asked that this get pulled, I believe. Did you have a question? You're recognized. It, uh, moved properly seconded. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is just me doing what I've been doing in the last two or three meetings. Uh, with metro leases and us getting a building. Uh, when we look at this particular one, it's uh, 72,000 square foot. The uh, dollar per square footage is 2708, comes about 1.95 million. And so I'm going to keep talking about how we need to save the Morris and uh, have uh, metro building spaces for metro offices. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other hands, all in favor? Any opposed? You approve, 13 in favor, zero against. We're on to item number 11, 2023-2369, Van Rees, Roten, and Welsh. 
approves a $19,500,000 grant agreement from the Metropolitan Government to the Community Foundation in Middle Tennessee for the purpose of creating a housing catalyst fund using American Rescue Plan Act from fund number 30216. We have a letter to, pr to approve from Council Member Van Reese and a proposed amendment. I can get a motion properly seconded. Uh, we have the proposed amendment and I'll let Council describe the amendment. Ms. Darby, you're recognized. Uh, this is a housekeeping amendment. Exhibit one to the agreement, which is attached to the resolution, was uh, left off, and this uh, attaches the exhibit one, which is essentially a grant budget. So we're on the amendment. All in favor? Any opposed? You approve 13 in favor, zero against. We are now back on the bill. All in favor? Oh, I apologize. Councilmember Mendez, you recognize. <laughs> I, um, during budget, or I'm sorry, affordable housing, I asked about the loss rate and appreciated the answer. I, I guess a follow-up question is, what in the um, other programs run by y'all, um, what is what is the administrative overhead uh, run for the program? Council Mendez, who are you speaking to in the back since you... Um, <laughs> I, I forgot the gentleman's name. He's walking up, he can introduce himself, or anybody can introduce himself. I'll offer a quick introduction to our project team. I'm Hannah Davis from the Housing Division. Uh, through the competitive process, we selected this team to help us uh, develop the Housing Catalyst Fund. Um, here we have um, Michael Friedman Schnapp from Forsyth Street Advisors. He'll be able to answer your question. We also have uh, Nelson Community Partners, Mick Nelson, and Pillars Development with Ed Henley. You're recognized. Please introduce yourself. Hi, good evening, Michael Friedman Schnapp from uh, Forsyth Street Advisors. Um, so just the question, could you just repeat the, the specific question? Yeah, um, during the last committee meeting, I asked about the loss rate and you told us 25 basis points. I guess I'm wondering, um, I assume uh, there's some administrative cost um, that comes out of the amount um, in the program. I guess I'm, I'm wondering what that runs. Yep, so uh, great question. So the, to run a loan fund uh, is around, um, but depending on how it's structured is around 800,000 to one and a half million dollars per year. A typical CDFI budget would be in the one and a half million to $3 million budget for a kind of uh, eight to uh, 12 person staff. We try and run our, and so that would run on a two to 3% loan spread is a typical model of a nonprofit loan fund. We try to run it with a one and a half percent spread on the loan over our cost of capital. And we're able to do that because we amortize our asset management staff across multiple funds. And in addition, um, we're not as heavy into program and technical assistance the way a CDFI would, and we're able to also use a number of third-party services for loan servicing, for auditing and accounting uh, across our different funds. So do, do you all set the rates um, to break even on the admin costs? Uh, essentially, yes. We're a fee. We're a fee fund manager. We don't have our own capital in it, um, and our fees are typically. Uh, align based on success. So there's a, often a fixed component um, and then a variable component based on helping close loans and the amount of assets under management. So, so we shouldn't expect um, that as a program goes on, say it goes on for four or five years, we shouldn't expect any erosion of the amount um, that goes out in the market due to administrative costs at all. Um, that's right. Our plan is to seek other sources of capital to bring into the fund so that it won't just solely depend on, on Metro, um, which is part of the, the work that we've been doing to structure it this way. Um, and so the Metro money, we hope, will remain as ways to, um, over time, absorb any losses as well as um, serve as uh, ways to offer a lower rate loans to higher impact projects. And so um, our, our hope is that the assets over time of the fund will grow even if we use up some of the net assets over time. Last bit I would add there is it takes a, a lot to start this up and we're hoping to get that our model shows that we will be able to bring in enough income from loans to support the operations. It takes two to four years to get to that point. And so some of the Metro money will be used to cover 
costs that are not covered by income during that period. And apologies, Chair, but this piqued my curiosity during the last committee meeting. Um, and then what's the time range that y'all have been doing this in other markets? And in particular, I'm interested in whether y'all have been through a market downturn, um, like obviously the 08 to 2010 is dramatic, but have you guys uh, managed um, using this model through a downturn? So the New York City Acquisition Fund um, was first made operational in 2006, and its sister, which owned by Lisk and Enterprise, the its sister fund in Los Angeles, the New Generation Fund, is owned by Enterprise and was founded in 2008. So we have made our way through that period, um, and that was the period of two of those lo of those three loss events for New York that I described. Um, in addition, the Baltimore Fund that we started. Uh, that we're fund manager for, as well as the San Francisco Housing Accelerator Fund, which is a nonprofit, it's an independent nonprofit that we're not fund managers for, but are financial advisors for, um, all made their way through COVID. Um, and so COVID was a little unusual in that there was a lot of government help for programs like that. And so we were able to take, uh, for Baltimore um, and San Francisco, which are CDFIs, we're able to take advantage of government help to through the different um, programs aimed at CDFIs for that period. All right, am, am I hearing you right that uh, the New York program that y'all have done since 06, you've suffered uh, three losses in that time period? That's correct. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Council Mendes. Council Member Hart, you're recognized. Yes, um, I, I guess I have a question about the minority participation on this particular uh, grant that has already been um, awarded. Um, the second thing is that concerns me is the fact that we approved the Housing Catalyst Fund and the initiation of it, but we had not identified who was going to be the administrator of that. And I just think that that's, those two things should be discussed prior to it being approved. And my third concern is, is that um, the Community Foundation had some concerns. Uh, well, Metro had concerns, as one of our colleagues brought up in regards to the use of the tornado relief funding that they received because it was not fairly distributed throughout and it was quite a bit of it still being left on hand when there were uh, communities in great need of it. So for me, I, I, I mean, I understand that they went through the RFP process and successfully bid it on this, but it does concern me that there were some pending issues with the Community Foundation about previous funding. So I'd like to have those three questions addressed. You're recognized in the back. Thank you, council member. Um, for the grant administration question, that is the purpose of coming here today. As you pointed out, which I appreciate, we came in 2021 at the end of 21 um, to for approval of the ARPA allocation for the program. And at that time we knew we needed a lot more information to better understand how the fund should be structured, who the right partners would be, um, you know, what the products should be uh, that would specifically accelerate creation and preservation of housing in our market. Um, and so that's the grant resolution for partnering with the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee that you see before you today. Uh, for minority participation on this specific team, uh, we went out through the pro uh, procurement department. And so they had their team that scores uh, the proposal based on mon minority participation and this Metro's minority participation goals. Um, and then the third uh, piece of it was about the community foundation um, and the uh, challenges associated with the tornado. Uh, for this program, Forsyth and the uh, Pillars Development and Nelson Community Partners will stay on that fund management team will stay on as the the fund manager. So the funds are, uh, you know, being transferred to the community foundation through this grant contract, but the original contract with Forsyth and the team will be maintained through that um, fund management relationship. Council member. So what exactly role is uh, the community foundation playing 
just the administrator of the funding? They are going to essentially be the fiscal sponsor uh, and then the uh, Forsyth and the team brings the expertise associated with managing a housing fund of this style. And how was the community foundation selected? Based on our options before us, uh, as we look to either start our own new nonprofit um, or to partner with another nonprofit in the city, there were not, um, you know, other foundations of this size that it would make sense to bring on, you know, an additional nineteen and a half million dollars onto their books in a way that, um, you know, wouldn't be disruptive to the rest of their balance sheet and would also be able to um, explore potentially partnering with the Housing Catalyst Fund in a significant way to pursue philanthrop additional philanthropic investment. When we came to you in 2021, that was one of our kind of hypotheses was that uh, the city putting out this $20 million would be a call to action to the philanthropic community. And with the community foundation being our largest community foundation in the region, we look forward to the opportunity to partner with them on a significant philanthropic campaign to recruit additional investment. And, and I can appreciate that, but I also think that we need to look at those forgotten communities to ensure that when we have uh, opportunities like this, that we are building capacity for some of those other smaller communities who would not adequately uh, comp compete against some of those larger organizations and businesses. So I think we need to be intentional about spreading the wealth that we have because I know that the American Rescue Plan funding was specifically created in order to help those communities that need it the most. And, and in situations like this, history has shown us that, um, that there has been disparities. And, and, and they continue to be, and it concerns me that we continue to approve legislation and grants that specifically um, show disparities amongst those smaller um, and, and those less socioeconomic communities who are able to uh, adequately compete. Thank, Thank you, you for your uh, response. Thank you, Councilmember Hurt. Seeing no other hands, all in favor. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Fircher, you're recognized. I was trying to get in here and go back through my notes and stuff when I was when I was chair with the. Uh, but anyway, anyway, chair. How long ago was that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> community foundation audit. Can, can anyone tell us where we are on that or what the results were? I'm looking around, y'all. Does anybody want to? Did it ever occur? <laughs> Kelly, you recognize? I have an unsatisfactory answer, and um, my co-member of audit committee, please opine if you remember more. It's definitely occurred. I don't know that's been completed. I, I don't. We haven't met in a while, but I haven't seen a final. That's more of a question mark than a statement. I don't remember. Okay, not not a problem, Director Phil. I don't. It's Chair, this has been, um, uh, many council members have, have expressed just the accountability for a community foundation, um, just the, the protocol, the process for us as a government, um, how these big dollars um, are only um, funneled um, through the community foundation, whether that's good, bad, or, bad, or, bad, or indifferent. When we talk about building equity and capacity here in, in the city, um, and, and we hear it over and over and over again that there is no other organizations um, that can handle that can handle such, Community Foundation hasn't made an effort to bring those other organizations along, nor us as a as a body has really been really been intentional about this either. Give you an example. Um, during a tornado, many task force were, were led, and we know, um, we know, we know, we know, we know that those dollars did not make it to the communities that those dollars were intended to serve. That's just one. That's just one. That's just one example. So I end it with this because um, this is my last budget and finance uh, committee meeting. 
I would like to encourage the next body, like when these when these um, when these grant agreements come forward, that um, that you put something in place that requires a more granular audit um, for for these dollars and capacity building needs to be needs, needs to be one of them. Because if not, we're going to be community foundation will ultimately end up just being the only player in the, in this space. And we know that for communities of 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 color, minority communities, sometimes their efforts do not do not reach our community. And that's not a slight on community foundation. That's that's just what that's just what it is, Chair. And um, it probably ended up being a, a statement more than a question, but I know the, the audit is unacceptable and um, it's not complete. So um, you can write me as a note, Chair. Councilmember Bircher, I want to thank you for that because I do recall I was giving you a hard time. How long ago was that? But we, but we, we took up that issue back. I remember since I was in a district that was hit hard by the tornado. I think this was one of the biggest issues that was brought up: is that where's the money going and how's it getting to the people that it's supposed to get to? And that was one of the things that you were focused on. So I appreciate that, um, Councilmember Hurt. You're recognized. Yes, I concur. Uh, with everything that Councilmember Virtue said, and as I recall within the uh, audit committee, that we went back and forth because there was a specific audit team that they did or did not want. And I don't think that the audit was ever done, and I know it was not completed because it was um, spoken that we could get our internal auditors to do it, and there was a specific group in that audit committee that they thought could do it, but it was such a monumental task that they chose not to, and um, so it was some discussion, but I don't think that it was ever done. Do you recall Councilmember Toombs? Councilmember Toombs, you're recognized. <laughs> It, the audit hasn't been done. I believe it's still on the list. Where we left off is we passed a motion that our uh, audit office would choose, um, would look at all the, all the circumstances and choose who would do the, the actual audit. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Hurt, you recognize. So I, too, uh, feel that we should not act on this at this particular time, considering the uh, concerns with with it, so I'm asking for a deferral. We have a, is that a motion? Yes, asking a motion to defer. We yeah. have a motion to defer. <laughs> Item 2023-2369. Um, I'm looking for a second. Had it properly seconded. Council Member Sledge on the deferral. You recognized. Oh, sorry, I don't. Council Member Sledge, you recognized. First, I need to ask if it's appropriate to table a motion in committee. I'm being told by council. We normally don't table in committees. We just vote on the deferral motion. So if that's what y'all... I'm asking if it's appropriate. I mean, I mean we can do it if y'all... I move to table the deferral motion. I've... Let me turn it. Let me, I'm going to turn council on so y'all can... It's just not something that we typically do in committee to table a motion. Um, the committee is just making a recommendation to the floor, and if it's a recommendation for deferral or approval, or um, not to recommend approval, then the you know on the floor the the it gets taken up. The motion to table involves the um, you know the the is it a five minute debate or is it just debate between you know the maker of the motion and the person upon against whom the motion was made. So it doesn't just, you know, stop discussion. It continues to move forward. But a deferral motion in this committee, if approved, would automatically defer this resolution on the floor tomorrow, correct? It should, yes, because it would be I, I the I bring my motion to table the deferral motion. 
So we have a motion to table the deferral motion properly seconded. All in favor, unless y'all want to. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give my debate first, I guess. Councilmember Sledge. Yeah, hold on a second. Okay, so, so one of the points that I wanted to make is that this actually is setting up a fund like this, this what, what we refer to in the Affordable Housing Committee as a strike fund. Um, setting up a strike fund like this is, is um, becoming more common, but quite frankly, we're a little bit ahead. You noted the cities that were mentioned um, by Forsyth were uh, larger cities that tend to be more on the forefront of doing affordable housing work like New York or LA, where they have to have a variety of tools because the crisis is so immense. Um, setting up a strike fund through a community foundation like this, like setting it up through an organization like the community foundation um, is pretty typical. Uh, City of Atlanta, in fact, um, just announced they had about 100 million. They got committed through just an extremely similar structure as this. The city committed a certain amount of money. In fact, the numbers are almost identical. And then the philanthropic organizations that were based out of those partner orgs were able to bring that number from basically 20 to 100, to 100 million that was committed toward affordable housing. So that's what's at risk if we defer this tonight, is that we, will, we won't just defer this for a little bit, it'll be deferred into a new administration, into a body that will change significantly, a body that has not done the work over the last three years to put the ARP funds in and has vetted what is exactly the same structure and format that we approved several years ago. The only role that the Community Foundation is playing is to serve as the house. They are the house for the money. They are not telling where the money is spent. They're not administering the money. That is done with the partners that we have already approved through an open procurement process that we approve the contract for. So that, that's why I want to kind of speak to the urgency of this. When we talk about the deferral, um, we would be putting off for months a process that they need the opportunity and time to stand up and then work on the short-term lending work that we heard about in the Affordable Housing Committee. There are other peer cities that are going through this process now, but are frankly years behind where we are. They want to set up a strike fund, but they are taking the first steps toward that policy now. And I just want to emphasize to you, this, <laughs> this crisis isn't going isn't to get resolved by us waiting. Um, putting this strike fund forward and putting it somewhere where then the access to those philanthropic dollars to multiply, which is what we all talked about when we set this up several years ago, is right there. That's the opportunity we have to take and we have to take it now because if we don't, we're gonna count on colleagues who are gonna be coming in, they're gonna ask questions that we've answered two or three years ago and that's no fault of them, they're gonna to wanna to do their due diligence. We as the body have done our due diligence and we need to finalize the steps we have taken over the last three years to do this. So with that, I would ask uh, colleagues on the committee to vote in favor of the tabling motion. Thank you, Chair. Council Member Hurt, you're recognized in opposition to the tabling motion. Thank you so very much. And I do appreciate this, but this is about more than housing. And I don't think that if we wait one meeting in order for it to be uh, addressed and further vet it and get some clarification clarity from the community foundation because the community foundation is going to receive funding as the administrator. And I think that for us to wait a couple of two, three, four months, many of these communities have waited decades to get their fair share in opportunities like this. And I don't think it's too much to ask for this body to ensure that there is opportunity for the funds to reach those communities that need it the most. And I ask colleagues to reconsider all of the other projects such as this. You can look at the funding, you can look at the Barnes funds, and you see that those forgotten communities are still, the, 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 the vision is growing larger and larger. 
the gap of wealth is growing larger and larger. So my thing is, is that if we are going to take care of all Nashville, let's do so. Let's take an opportunity like this in order to help build the capacity with organizations that can assist moving forward and not just continue to do what we've always done. Because when we do what we've always done, we're going to get what we always got. Thank you, Councilmember Hurt. We are on a tabling motion. If you're in favor of tabling the deferral motion, please raise your hand. Seven. Seven in favor. If you're opposed to the tabling motion, please raise your hand. Seven in favor, two against. Abstentions. abstentions. Two abstentions. Seven in favor, two against. Two abstentions. Tabling motion fails. We are back on the bill, 2023-2369. Uh, Council Member Swar, you're recognized. The table motion was successful. Um, um, it was successful. I apologize. It was successful. <laughs> Sorry, I did it fail. It was successful. The deferral motion was tabled, yes. There we go. Yeah. Council Member Swar, you're recognized. Thank you. I, I wanted to make two comments. Um, one is that I would like the... Uh, the gentleman from uh, the company to come and speak to the question that I asked during affordable housing about how does this bill support the people, minority, small developers that don't have access to capital, that are the people that we're trying to help because they cannot get into the market. And I think that was a different question, which I think part of what Councilmember Hurt is trying to address is that, is that one of the reasons why this Catalyst Fund is so important is that there are a lot of people that want to get into the business, but they cannot match they cannot match the bonds funding or they cannot, you know, so that's what this loan is supposed to do to help us create more housing and to help us open the market for those organizations that we're talking about. So I, I asked the question in affordable housing and thank you was answered. I would like that to be repeated so that we can know that that's been addressed. The other thing is that the idea of the community foundation and the audit, I don't want to gloss over that either because I think it's a, it's a genuine concern. So my question to the legal team and the, the, the administration, whoever is coming next, is can we not require an audit from the community foundation before all of this progresses or at some point? Because the audit is never done and there were questions about that. So can we not make a request for that as part of moving this along, but I don't want to delay it. We need housing. We need to get the small businesses to be able to be a part of it. We need to keep it moving, but we also need that accountability uh, to be able to get that audit report as well. Okay, so we had a two-part question. Uh, could you repeat the first part? I think you uh, The first part is how do we ensure that small businesses that are not able to get funding uh, to be able to leverage bonds fund, how do they benefit from this loan program? What is the focus on them specifically? And I think you had explained the program in New York or something. Would you please repeat that if you don't mind, please? Yes, thank, thank you, Council Member. So um, the fund plans initially in offering three products, um, acquisition loans, pre-development loans and bridge loans for to bridge grant proceeds that are available later in the project. And so the idea that all of these would be available before the permanent funding that's available from things like the Barnes Fund or THDA are, are available. Um, to your question about um, equity inclusion of minority owned developers, um, we think that the pre-development funding is uh, loans are especially important for this. Um, the idea would be to offer these as recourse loans to developers who are early in a project who do not quite have enough capital to move from to, to get to close to get to closing on their construction and permanent financing and that um, minority owned developers would be a very specific focus of this. This was a need that we heard. Um, we had about two dozen conversations um, with uh, different folks uh, who are mission developers, um, CDFIs um, and a number of MBEs. Um, we presented to the Red Academy, um, who's working with uh, emerging uh, minority-owned developers, and we also met se uh, individually with several early-stage MBE developers. And what we heard from them is that um, with banks and sometimes with CDFIs, that the guarantee, the strength of the guarantees that they can offer um, are not acceptable to those institutions, and so they're not able to move forward with projects. Um, because of the city funding acting as 
um, credit enhancement for the fund, this fund would be able to make loans to those folks in early stage uh, pre-development where they're trying to move forward, whether it's land that they own, have an option on, or are partnering with a, a joint venturing with a nonprofit. The last thing was, um, you know, just we, this is something that we do in a lot of our work. Our New York fund, which I've spoken the most about, is an acquisition fund that also offers pre-development funding. Um, after partnering with the city, it's now transitioned to solely lending to nonprofits, uh, MBEs and WBEs for acquisition funds because of the direction that we wanted to go. And so we tried to make sure that we're, that we're doing the appropriate underwriting um, to make sure that we're not counting out folks who traditionally get counted out by, by other means. The last thing I would say is that the, the Baltimore Fund, which I haven't really spoken uh, earlier about the affordable housing uh, committee about, um, is capitalized by the city of Baltimore. The city of Baltimore put $50 million in it from uh, the long-term lease of a downtown, set of downtown assets into a fund that can only invest in the two-thirds of the city where the residents are majority black. And so it's created this new CDFI that's specifically focused on those communities. And it's also adopted special, we've helped them adopt special purpose credit program uh, guidelines which allow them to give higher uh, loan to value ratios, meaning more money against the same collateral for MBEs and WBEs, and also um, to, in certain cases, um, allow lower interest rates for those borrowers. So we certainly understand and operate, you know, we operate in the world uh, that we're working here. We're also um, hoping that our colleagues at Pillars uh, in the form of um, Ed Henley and Mick Nelson from Nelson Community Partners will be on the ground uh, and will help guide us through and through all these relationships that we need to navigate to this successfully. Uh, for me, you know, that's one of the biggest things that we've heard a lot of people wanting to get into the housing business, but they cannot due to funding. And I think that's why this program is important and I think we need to get it going. But my next question is that with regards to the audit, uh, um, and <laughs> Ms. Dabby, you can help me out with this. What is the best way to proceed with that? Because I do think if there's a requirement for an audit and it's not being done, can we make it a requirement for the uh, contract or what is the best way to do that? Director Darby, you recognize. I think Kelly oh. should answer the question. Ooh. Director Flannery, you recognize. Just clarify it. I'm sorry, I, I forgot. Um, Councilmember Toombs, you're also on the audit committee, so guys, keep me honest. But the scope of that audit was specific just to the tornado dollars only. It wasn't an overview or review of the entire foundation. It was specific to the tornado funding. I think the issue wasn't that the foundation wasn't a partner with the proposed auditor. I think it was that we were trying to piggyback on state contracts and one of the auditors had a conflict. I don't think it was anything the foundation wasn't a partner or agreeable to. And I really hope I'm not saying things that we said in closed session, but um, <laughs> this is my memory of it. And I just, I don't recall where we are in the process and um, I can reach out to internal audit and hopefully get them the next couple of minutes. But I just want to be clear, it was not a review of the entire foundation. Those audits, you know, their fiscal audits are available. We have those, but it was just specific to the tornado programming and funding. So if I remember when I was on the audit committee, we could ask the internal audit to do a special review of the tornado funds if we so choose. And that was the ask. That's what we've asked them to do. I just can't recall if it's been completed. I mean, we haven't met since June. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure if she has more to glean. I, I, I just don't remember. You're recognized. Um, a community Foundation just sent an email from Barry Dunn, who Metro had selected, and they notified the Community Foundation that they're sending their um, submitting an updated draft report to OIA by this Thursday. It was Barry Dunn because Shulman thought that Barry Dunn was a guy. All right, so uh, so, <laughs> so we need a copy of that audio report as soon as we can get it. I think uh, for the sake of the community and people that are asking and everything with Tornado, I think we, we cannot just gloss over that accountability part of it. And so thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Suara. Councilmember Toombs, and then I got Councilmember Hurt, then I got Councilmember Vercher, and Councilmember Gamble. Lower, we got them. Okay, we got a lot of folks here. Let's see. Councilmember Toombs, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. So I just have a, a, a clarifying question, maybe two. So for the Catalyst Fund, Community Foundation is the fiscal sponsor of the $19.5 million. Does Community Foundation have any 
discretion or any say in the decision making as to how those funds are used? Sorry, right. you're recognized. No. So does, does, do they receive compensation for holding the funds? Not at this time. If the relationship were to evolve, if they the fund basically becomes permanent there and we contract with them for specific overhead services, uh, they would, but not as a fiscal sponsor. So right now they're just holding the funds. They don't get any money. They don't get to decide how to use the money. I don't have any further right. questions, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Toombs. Council Member Hurt, you recognize. So could the Community Foundation be receiving interest on the funds that they have? You recognize. Um, that's a very good question. The intention is for any interest from un uninvested cash uh, or cash that is invested in, you know, there's a section of the grant agreement that you can refer to that says that it's in highly liquid, highly secure things if it's not invested in loans and it to be an investment policy. The intention is for all of the proceeds from that to go to cover administrative costs, if not, for, for this specific program and that it's not for the general use of the community foundation. Okay, um, but let, let me be clear, this is not about the housing catalyst fund and the intent of what this project and program is about. This is specifically, in my opinion, about ensuring that the funds are reaching the communities in which they were designed to reach. And I'm just asking the question, not trying to stop anything from happening, but there is that part of accountability with the Community Foundation and the opportunity to help build capacity for another nonprofit organization as well as small businesses. So it's not to rain on anything that is actually being done. And I'm not sure if one meeting deferral would really make that much of a difference. Council member Virtue, you recognize. Thank you, Chair. And the answer is, is yes, that they are receiving something. We just don't know what that is and what that, what that amount is. This is going to be lumped into some type of admin type cost, admin type fee, whatever, whatever they're calling it these days. I just want to be clear, Chair, as a budget and finance committee, that the committee is okay with saying yes to $19.5 million without knowing what the audit states about this particular entity. That's just the, the point. Um, I'm making chair. Thank you, Council Member Virtue. Council Member Gamble, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. I guess my my question revolves around the RFP process and selecting the community foundation. Don't have any issues with the community foundation being the fiduciary agent of the Catalyst Fund. Just wondered, were there during the RFP process, were there any um, minority firms or organizations that applied and was there any consideration for using a sub uh, prime contractor as, as well as the community foundation in administering funds to try to ensure equity and how those, um, how those uh, funds were administrated even though the community foundation is not making decisions on who receives the money. They are the fiduciary agent. So just wondering if there were any other considerations for uh, other fiduciary um, agents to fall under the community foundation to spread out who who is actually administering the fund. We had someone coming up in the back. You're recognized. Uh, the original team that was part of the procurement process was, uh, I mean, there was one MBE included Pillars Development, Nelson Community Partners, and Forsyth as the lead. Um, and as part of that contract, we had the option for them to, like I said, we could start our own new nonprofit or select a nonprofit or look at a, a different 
legal structure. Um, and so we selected the Community Foundation because they're the only one of this size that could be a partner on this. And to Council Member Sledge's point, be able to lead a community-wide philanthropic campaign to recruit additional funds. Um, in 2021, when we set out here and uh, seeked approval for these funds, we wanted to the Metro's money to really take advantage of this ARPA money and use this as a call to action to the community. And so we need a foundation of that size to be able to lead that kind of campaign. Um, and so that's why we're here today to make sure that we're moving expeditiously against that ARPA timeline. Uh, you know, we know we're working up against a clock, but we feel really confident about the progress we've made and the partners we've selected. Vice Chair, you're recognized. Thank you. I, I appreciate your response and that does uh, answer the question as to how the community foundation was selected. I guess my other question is, can you give us a preview of how many organizations were considered in that RV, RFP concert, uh, process or was it just solely uh, the decision of, of the, the whatever partners, I can't remember the name, but the Nelson partners to decide to go with community foundation and not consider a group of, of requests or applications. You recognize. Um, as part of that contract, we were able to select someone um, through kind of our decision tree of what was the best legal structure for this. So the fiscal sponsorship option made sure that we were able to keep moving forward in a timely manner and keep the overhead costs as low as possible um, rather than looking into starting a whole new nonprofit. Um, so there wasn't a, a pool of applicants for that portion because the um, qualified uh, entities, nonprofits that would be appropriate, it's really only the community foundation that's large enough for that. Okay, so this was somewhat of a sole source. I mean, there wasn't an RFE process where you consider proposals. It was decided based on who it was known to have the capacity to administer the program. Well, and based on the recommendation of the lead entity and the project team who we success selected through the competitive process. And at that time, as we were going through the contracting process, we included language that would allow them to, uh, to determine and recommend the best entity. And so they did leave the option up to, you know, the city to determine if we wanted to go through the process of starting a new nonprofit and take on those, you know, associated time and those costs. And we, you know, opted not to do that based on the deadline of the ARPA uh, funds. Thank you. Councilmember Hart to recognize. This is the last time I'm going to get up and say anything in regards to this. But this sounds just like the neighborhood stabilization program that was created when there was a $30 million uh, grant that had been given to the city of Nashville. And there was a MDHA who served as the administering body. And the housing fund, Woodbine Community, and Urban Housing Solutions were the recipients of that. But because it was based on 17 sisters tracks and nine of them were in the North Nashville community, we went to the mayor and asked about having some of that money because it was not fair for those organizations to come into the North Nashville community, buy up the property, rehab the property, and benefit from it when you had a community that needed it themselves. So this is basically the same thing. The North Nashville Consortium was created as a result of the Neighborhood Stabilization Program, and they did not have the capacity to apply for those funds, and I believe that we have to keep those organizations in mind and include them in opportunities like these. That North Nashville Consortium consists of other smaller nonprofit organizations that have done housing, including Being Help a Hand Foundation, the New Level CDC, the 15th Avenue Baptist, now William F. Buchanan uh, CDC and the Jefferson Street United Merchants Partnership, CDC. So I just think that we have to make sure that no community, no block is left behind in situations such as these. We know that housing is a crisis and we need it, but I think we have to make sure that we include and support all Nashvilleians. Thank you, Councilmember. 
Seeing no other hands, we're on the bill, or the resolution, I should say. All in favor, please raise your hand. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Opposed? Two. Any abstentions? I think that's it. Eight in favor, two against. You recommend approval. 2023-2372, wrote in Benedict Welsh, approves Amendment 1 to a grant from the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee to the Information Technology Services Department to fund the position of Digital Inclusion Officer to manage the allocation of resources to ensure equitable services, delivering expanded economic opportunities and meeting the needs of the underserved. Move properly seconded. Council Member Syracuse, it's good to hear from you. You're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is... Wait, this is not 2380. This one was pulled by Council Member Swara, but she has oh. left, so uh, if... Move approval. <laughs> <laughs> Moved and properly seconded. Seeing no other hands, all in favor? Any opposed? You approve. Ten in favor, zero against. On to 2023-2380, we're opening in Syracuse, approves amendment number one to a sole source contract between the Metropolitan Government and FUSIS, Inc., to increase the value of the contract and send the term of the contract. Move properly. Second to Council Member Syracuse, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Move for indefinite deferral. A motion for indefinite deferral, properly seconded. All in favor? Oh, sorry, Council Member Mendez on the indefinite deferral. You're recognized. Um, if there's just a brief comment about why, I'd appreciate it. Councilmember Syracuse, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, th there's some complexities here with this that um, um, I, I, we need to dive into. There's not a lot of time to do so. And uh, in consultation with uh, COB, uh, the administration, and the police department, uh, I think we all agree that uh, this needs to be uh, put to the next term. And that, with that explanation, all in favor for indefinite deferral? Aye. Any opposed? You approve for definite deferral. Ten in favor, zero against. Twenty twenty three twenty three eighty one approves the construction agreement between CSX Transportation and the National Department of Transportation Multimodal Infrastructure for the reimbursement of CSXT performed railroad crossing safety improvements at Davidson Road near Harding Pike. Um, we have a proposed amendment by Council Member Druffel and uh, a motion properly seconded. Uh, if Council could explain the amendment, you're recognized. Uh, this is another housekeeping amendment. There was a um, typographical error in the dollar figure for this uh, agreement. So seeing no hands, all in favor? Any opposed, you approve the amendment. 10 in favor, zero against, on to the bill. Um, no, Aaron, you can't say anything. All in favor? Any opposed? You approve. Ten in favor. Zero against. 2023-2385, uh, by wrote and authorizes the Metropolitan Department of Law to settle the claims of April Curry, Old South Construction, Aspen Construction, MRB Developers, LLC, against the Metropolitan Government in the amount of $150,674.47 with 76,695 CMP paid from the judgments and losses fund and 73,978.80 to be paid from the NDOT sidewalk fund. Moved and properly seconded. Um, 26 and 27, these judgments are being paid out because of the sidewalk uh, lawsuit. And I didn't know if, I just kept them off consent, just pulled them just to make sure if anybody had any questions. If I don't see any hands, so I think we all know why, why we're here on this one, so, uh, and it's late, so. Seeing no hands, all in favor? Any opposed? You approve. Ten in favor, zero against. 2023-2386, authorized the Metropolitan Department of Law to compromise settle claims to James Knight and James Knight. 22,000, 224,343.91 with 215,460.7 to be paid out of the Judgments and Losses Fund and $8,883.21 to be paid out of the NDOT Sidewalk Fund. Motion properly seconded. All in favor? Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm good. Okay, Councilman, Council members did not want to talk on this one. All in favor, aye. Opposed, 10 in favor, zero against. Which one did I skip? Number 24. Oh. 
oh, I did skip one, and Director Darby has got to do her job tonight. 2023-2382, Evans wrote in Pulley and Hancock, approves an intergovernmental agreement between the United States Department of Transportation and the National Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure for acceptance of a strengthening mobility and revolu revolutionizing transportation grant to install LIDAR and video camera technologies at key intersections at mid-block segments for near-miss data collection. Move properly seconded. Councilmember Evans, you're recognized. You look ready for that. I'm sorry. Well, I didn't know um, from our last meeting when it was late filed and we didn't move it. Um, if there were still any lingering questions from anybody, I believe everybody's questions have been answered, but I want to give space in case there's not. Thank you, Councilmember Evans. Seeing no hands, all in favor? Any opposed? You approve. 10 in favor, zero against. 31. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 2023-2391, Rutten Withers and Pulley authorizes the Director of Public Property to exercise an option agreement for the purchase of flood-prone property located at 720 Height Street for Metro Water Services. Uh, move properly seconded. Councilmember Allen, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I had asked the same question last time, which is this is... Um, Appraised at 250000 and we're, we're paying 440000 for it, and Metro Water has nicely provided me the appraisal report, which I appreciate. Um, the comparables are, are similar-sized or larger um, structures that are in the neighborhood, but none of them is in a floodway, and this one property is in a floodway. So I just, I'm not an appraiser. I just would love for someone to answer the question. When you do an appraisal on a piece of property, do you not take into account the fact that it sits in a floodway? And does that not figure into what we should be paying for it? I think. I'll let the administration answer it. The answer is yes, but I mean. <laughs> one, would, one would think. One would think. Do you recognize, please introduce uh, yourself. Jim Snyder, Metro Water, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, council member, no, it doesn't, ironically, it doesn't affect that. And this way, this way the process is set up. It has to be fair market value based on uh, the house as though it's not encumbered. As though it's not encumbered. That's right. Okay. Well, I can't argue with that. I just wanted to ask the question. Thank you. You're welcome. Learn something new every day. <laughs> council member Mendez, you recognize. Rotor is worth. That's the same answer we heard a few years ago when this came up. Uh. There well, and, and practically speaking, like you can't find comparables that are also on a floodway. That's very true. Thank you, Councilman Mendez. All right. Seeing no other hands, all in favor? Any opposed? You approve. 10 in favor, zero against. Yep. We have three late items. Um, item number 33, Syracuse and Evans appropriates 48000 from the Community Safety Fund for the grant to United Neighborhood Health Services, Inc., doing business as Neighborhood Health for Napier and Sudicum Community Safety Programs. Moved and properly seconded. Seeing no hands. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You approve. Ten in favor, zero against. Late filed resolution, Syracuse and Evans appropriates 20000 from the Community Safety Fund for a grant to Creative Girls Rock for Napier and Sudicum Community Safety Programs. Move properly seconded. Seeing no hands. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You approve. Ten in favor. Zero against. And last but not least for this term, y'all, for the Budget and Finance Committee. Woo -hoo. Late filed resolution by Syracuse, a resolution appropriating a total of $1 million from the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, acting by and through the Metropolitan Health Department to Nashville Health and authorizing the Metropolitan Department of Health to enter into a grant contract with Nashville Health for a healthy Nashville study. Moved and properly seconded. No hands. Councilmember Syracuse, he doesn't want to talk. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? You approve, 10 in favor, zero against, and for the last time, we are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. 
If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.